I am elated to be spending International Women's Day 2022 in Accra, Ghana with some of the most phenomenal young women I know. Despite the challenges confronting our world, these women provide me with so much hope and optimism about the future. They are brilliant, bold, and beautiful. And we're here in the Dominion TV studio to talk about women rising above barriers and addressing biases, particularly as women of color, I believe we have a lot to say. As all of you know, we're still fighting the effects of a global pandemic that has taken its greatest economic toll on women. According to the World Health Organization, as a direct result of COVID-19, an estimated 247 women aged 15 and above are now living on less than $1.90 per day. An estimated 53%, that's 132 million of these women are from Sub-Saharan Africa. The IMF and the UN Development Program projects that it will take us until 2030 to revert to pre-pandemic levels. And that's pre-pandemic levels, not the desired economic levels for women. While this pandemic is leaving poorer women poorer across the globe, the wealth of the wealthiest, 10% in our world, so their wealth is increasing, now topping $13 trillion, rising from $8 trillion just before the pandemic. Now, I'm not one to despise wealth, but this figure screams that we must and can do better. There's broad recognition that if as a global community, we just address the inequalities faced by women, that would add $28 trillion to the global economy. This tells us that when women rise, all boats are likely to rise. And this is not about entitlement. It's about equality of opportunity. And this is the challenge before us on this International Women's Day. So I'd like to ask my team as women of Africa, let your, let's hear your voices. How can we more quickly and effectively address these barriers and achieve equality of opportunity among women? Who'd like to go first? Very excited about this opportunity to talk about women in Africa. And to speaking about breaking the bias, bias, I will start off with the cultural bias. And I'm glad we're talking about equal opportunity, not gender equality. I don't believe in giving the woman an opportunity because she's a woman, but because she's good enough for that. And for every person, for you to be good at something, it comes with dedication, hard work, working late. And I believe women should not be forced to choose between nurturing the home and building a career. A woman should not be made to feel guilty for wanting to do better for herself or wanting to be ambitious. It's okay for a woman to have help with nurturing the kids. It's okay for a woman to come home late. Um, society would always judge a woman that you are neg neglecting your responsibilities as a mother or your bad mother because you're not there for your kids. And I believe it's just important to be there when it's important, like important occasions, you can be there for your children. But you should also be given the chance to also work hard, to also go the extra mile. Your husband should also be supportive. Family should understand that you're also trying to build a career and you're also trying to be a model, role model for your kids as well. You should not be made to choose between raising a home and having a career. So I believe it begins with the cultural bias. Women should not be given so much responsibility that 
everything that has like if the home is supposed to go well it's dependent on the woman if women are supposed to if children are supposed to be raised right it depends on the woman but it's a societal thing the man can help family can also help it's okay for a woman to want the best for herself and she shouldn't, she shouldn't be made to feel guilty for that Wow. What do you all have to say about, um, Alexi, thank you, um, because I hear a lot about that, about the cultural pressure on women to do it all and have it all and balance it all and carry it all at the same time. And if they don't, they're judged. Um, what do you have to say about that? How does one address that? I think that... Um Part of addressing that is women beginning to have a better understanding and appreciation of, appreciation of who they are and be able to say, even though society says I should be this, they make up their minds to be what they, they want to be. And um, as she's saying, there's, the, there's a need for that support system though, for the family to understand and if the family understands, then society can understand. Sometimes society can understand what you desire to do as a woman or in your, your place, as they would say, in the workplace or in the home. But if your own family also doesn't understand, then that can become another barrier that the woman has to sort of jump over. But I think the first step is for women to know who they are and who they want to be and be bold enough and courageous enough to speak up. Well, so what I'm hearing is that women need more support and understanding. That's true. And that women should boldly communicate um, what they want and what they need. And it's not just the woman's responsibility to carry the home and to carry all these pressures alone. The family should chip in, the husband, has a responsibility. Now, I, I, let me ask you this. Culturally, does the husband have equal responsibility in the home or does it just depend? Um, if I may, I, I think it's re really dependent. Um, every marriage is unique. So your husband, you, a man and a wife know what they bring to the table, what they contribute to the household. In some households, the man is the breadwinner, he brings the money. So it really has to be come down to a mutual understanding between the partners where their greatest strengths are and what they can contribute to that marriage. So if me as the wife, I know that I'm the one, I can cook very well, so I'll do the cooking. How can my husband make up for that? Well, he probably would do, he would iron our clothes just before we come to work. So there's this give and take in terms of where are my short, shortcomings and where can he meet me on that, on that front and what, which aspects of my strengths can I also give? So it's truly a partnership in, in running the household, in my opinion, honestly. I like that because it is a partnership and I hear you saying um, it depends on your strengths and that everybody has to kind of customize their own situation as opposed to feeling that you have to be relegated to these prescribed boxes that may work with one family and, and, and may not work for another. But what I hear a lot about and I've heard it from you all um, is uh, this, this cry, if, if for lack of a better word, for understanding. Women all over the world say we need more understanding. And I know that um, we're different, but as women of Africa, what do you think is, what, in what areas, um, would you like or you believe that women need more understanding or what does the world need to know about women and the situation of life in Africa to provide more understanding? I mean, I think primarily there's a question of education and I think 
not, and I'm not even speaking about formal education, although of course that's a, an excellent tool for lifting women in particular out of poverty and providing more opportunities and access to women. I think sort of going back to the whole question of culture, part of the reason why it can be, I think even a little bit more difficult for African women is because we ourselves have internalized um, a lot of cultural biases that then trap us in a box. And so I think that when we talk about sort of being more understood, there isn't one single way to be an African woman. And I think that's something that needs to be more widely spread. I think African men as well need to do better about educating themselves about women's rights and educating themselves about the fact that, you know, like what if, um, FWA was saying, Th that sort of navigation of partnership and married life is only possible with an open-minded partner. That's true. Because regardless of if you're really good at cooking or if your husband is really good at cooking and you're not that good at cooking, but he has said culturally women cook, you'll be forced to cook even if it doesn't make any sense for your particular marriage. So I feel like a lot of men and women in Africa need to just be better educated about what exactly women should be able to accomplish and what it means to not only be in a partnership in a marriage but to be an employee um to be a friend to be a human being i think women are also very um often relegated to the roles that they occupy um so they don't really have like individuality outside of okay she's a mother okay she's a wife i think when women are allowed to cultivate their individual selves which i think also goes along with like what you were saying nosisa then you have better outcomes for women because they can say hey maybe i actually like to paint and i want to be an artist or maybe i'm really good with numbers i want to be an accountant but if your whole life is dedicated to serving other people via your role as a mother as a sister as a daughter as a wife you're never going to have time to understand yourself to even be able to vocalize your desires or say who it is that you actually want to be and I think that really all starts with having a very good education about possibility being told that you can be more than who you've been told that you can be mm -hmm. and also like having a good support system having a family that will help you that will push you that will tell you hey like if you want to be an astronaut that's something you can do you know having authority figures in your life that support you and want you to be whoever who opened the doors of possibility for you i think that sort of education that sort of um unlocking of possibility is very key to even giving women the idea that they can have these things because a lot of women genuinely don't even think it's an option that is so true if, if i may just add to that very quickly i think it's important to, to note i have oh, the, okay it's important to note that um i think for a lot of us women and please disagree if if you do um we recognize the realities that we we as women we are the child bearers as an example we recognize that fact it's not like we're ne neglecting that fact um when it comes to giving birth to a child, we are the first point of care. We know that. That's, we recognize that we just don't want to be limited by what society defines us to be. And that's where people tend to think, oh, you women of everyday gender equity. That's, that's not the point. It's, we know that as women, there's some things that God has given, has designed us to be as women. But beyond that, beyond what society tells us to do, we want to be acknowledged that, oh, if she wants to do this, she can give her the equal opportunity to, to do so, to just add in that. Okay, so just to look at the other dimension to this, I also think that women should sometimes ask for support. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we feel we are like superpowers and we can do it all. And obviously because of society, you see your mom doing it. So if you don't do it or you see your auntie doing it, and if you don't do it, you have people labeling you or calling you a name. But if you need help as a woman, just ask for it. You need blend in your career for the home and everything, and you can't do it all. So asking for support can help you to be able to achieve as much as you want to achieve. Yeah. And tell me this, I'm gonna go on this side now. How do we, I think in all societies, we have uh, cultural practices that um, serve us and we should preserve them and some others that should evolve. When it comes to the way things are done, because that's what culture really is, how are things done um, in many ways, um, how do we change this? How do we change 
these, uh, uh, these biases that are buried in culture and the way things have been done over time and over time? Um, well, I think um, we can start with education in schools. So we know that from, say, age three, um, onwards or upwards, we most of the stuff we learn, well, basically is from the school, right? So if we are able to design our curricula in such a way that it reflects, you know, the various opportunities that women can have, that they don't feel relegated to be just a mother or a daughter or a wife, we could let them know that there are, there are no limitations for the woman. So for example, you realize that when you come into a home, um, sometimes for all the typical African home, we see that for, a, for a, a male child, his parents can get him a football as a toy or can get him um, a stethoscope just to ingrain that mentality that you could be a doctor someday. But then for most females, almost like girl, child, um, girl children, you realize that they give them dolls, they give them cooking set so in their mind they feel like okay while i'm growing up this is a kind of toy and it actually plays a very large role in the kind of ambitions that women have or how they see themselves 20 years down the line because they've been relegated to playing with dolls so if you play with a doll typically you would be thinking about being a mother or if you're always trying to um use your cooking set i mean your your kitchen your kitchen tools it means that you would be a great cook so you would be a good wife but then we could also you know try and ingrain that mindset in the females as well you can give them a set of scripts that they will know that okay you could be a doctor you could let them watch documentaries on um like insura said going to space so that they could you know just fathom what would it be like just to step outside of the planet you know just creates those and it, it goes it goes a long way in changing our mentality because when you start with a child it's easier but when you grow as an adult sometimes it gets difficult because you've spent so many years being told you cannot do this so even when someone is trying to tell you that you can you really doubt it and i feel like that is another thing that holds men back we sort of have an inferiority complex when it comes to the things that we can do because growing up we were given so many limitations. So we felt like, okay, let me just step back and let the men take the lead. That is a very good point because a lot of this is subconscious programming in our minds. So um, what we're saying is that little girls have been conditioned to be in this box. Yeah. And sometimes men have been already conditioned to treat us in certain ways. Society has already been conditioned to limit us. Just, just to add to that, okay. what she said, sorry, about mm -hmm. education. About education. Um, I tweeted some two years back. I was going through my daughter's uh, school textbook and lo and behold, gr all the girls in the textbook are nurses and all the boys in the book were doctors. And I kept telling her that you can be a doctor. She said, no, I can't be a doctor. I can only be a nurse and I, I was so upset about it I had to tweet and, and tag the Ministry of Education because I was disappointed and it's, it's, it adds to what Danifo is saying that from an early age this little girl had it not been me noticing as I'm taking her through homework I may not have noticed that this is what she's being fed because she's also being taught by individuals at the time I look back that also were limited to the area they knew. They, they, they too, the teachers could not see themselves beyond what they were doing then. And it's so important, I think, um, for us to take a closer look at the curricula that the schools are using and what yeah. they're teaching the children because they spend more time with them than we do sometimes. By the time we get home, they're two, three, two hours or more before it's time for them to go to bed. But someone has spent the day telling them that you cannot, you cannot, you yeah. cannot, you cannot. So education, I think it's a very important uh, tool to, to get the, the girl child to see herself beyond what society says. The right education. The, the right, right education, with the right curriculum. <laughs> okay, so just to add to what they were saying, um, I think not 
whilst we are being educated on these steps, um, we should come out of our shelves and then be more innovative so that we can get the supports we need to go up there. So that's what I have to say. So Patricia, I have a question for you. You're working at, Dom all of you all are working women because you work here at Dominion Television and I am pleased that 95% of our senior team, uh, those positions are occupied by women. And as the world can see, um, we, we uh, have no issue with empowering women here. Um, how does it make you feel as a young woman, you and Nana FY, I think you're the younger among us, and Alexi too, and in sure too, wait a minute, I think they've outnumbered, I've, out, I've, I've outnumbered, but all of you are really young, especially compared to me. But when you walk into an environment and you've worked elsewhere, when you see women leading, does that help to um, reprogram some of the prior programming in your mind about the limitations of women? I'd like to hear from you too. I'd like to hear from both of you about that. Working here and seeing our bosses being women has encouraged me has changed that perception that you can do it. You have to come out of your shell and be bold and be confident. And you learn that you are a woman, but you are not limited. You can go out there, go out there and get it. And that alone is, is a plus. That alone is a push. So I believe it's good as we being here, it's good and it's encouraging. Yes. I, I think when I came in um, to work here, I was really glad and motivated to see um, um, my boss being a lady, a woman, and then um, Carla, and then Nosisa. I was motivated to do more, and I think um, it was encouraging. It was encouraging. So that's my, my message also to women, that um, I know for me, I, uh, I stand on the shoulders of some great women from the time I was young. Um, women who inspired me, who supported me, who encouraged me, women who had already broke the glass ceiling of our day. And I think that my message is as women, um, even as young women, we should always be carrying other women on our shoulders. We should always be encouraging. And I agree with you, Nosisa. Um, in as much as possible, we shouldn't leave it up to the school system um, to teach our children. But we are all working women. But we are confronted every day with women who are working hard, maybe in the informal sector, who don't have the opportunity. We're talking about curriculum and they can't get their children to, into a school. And uh, you see the tremendous uh, suffering, even not understanding the weight of carrying so much weight physically, not to mention the emotional weight. And those women, um, I think in many ways we have to be the voice, their voice, because um, they have suffered the greatest as a result of this pandemic, and they were already suffering before. So we've talked about some internal things, the cultural things, but um, we have to move together as women. What can be done? Uh, in Ghana, across Africa. Just quickly tell me the most important thing that you c think that can be done about the most vulnerable women. And I would say they're the most vulnerable people in our society because poverty has a, ten t a, a tendency to be generational. Education can be generational until someone breaks the barrier. I'll start with you, Effa. What do you think is the most single most important thing we can do for and with the women that we see every day who are going through untold suffering? Um, 
I can only come from the perspective of the community I live in and seeing such women around me and being acknowledging what God has blessed me with so far and the opportunities I've been provided to date. And so I always think of how can I extend that to women who are, who are even more vulnerable than, than me or didn't, didn't have as much opportunity than me. So for example, there's a lady who comes and cleans my house every day. Um, she, I know very well that her mom is the one who sells tomatoes in the at the market. So what I know is that she's trying to get into nursing school. I know very well that I can support her. So I would maybe every month I'll say, I'll give you this amount of money to, towards your education. In my own little way, this, this is how I know I can help her. Because I know that if I help her or I contribute to her success, she can even support her mother and even her children. So in my own way, this is how I know I can lend the opportunity. To well, children. don't underestimate the yeah. impact of that support. Because I believe that, you know, if you can break it with one person, you can break it for an entire generation. I've mm -hmm. seen that with my own eyes. And Shira? Um, um, I wouldn't want to assume that I would know the best way to help these vulnerable women because I've never personally been in that position before. And I think a lot of the time there's institutions, there's governments, there's foundations trying to help these women and they don't listen to these women. They have no idea what these women actually need. Mm -hmm. And they come in with good intentions, but good intentions don't really mean much if they don't have material impacts that benefit these women. And I think what I will say is as a, in our Ghanaian culture as a community, we do a very good job of individually helping um, people who are less fortunate than us. Like we may not be, I think Western culture is very much like, let's have a huge charity and do things through that. I think our ours is much more direct. And I think in some ways you could even argue that it's probably more effective. Um, but I think beyond that, there needs to be a larger institutional push from the government and from other community leaders. Because again, we're African, there's the government, but we also have our traditional rulers who have a lot of um, influence in their communities and know what's going on in their communities oftentimes better um, than government officials. So I think for them to make it a priority to get women educated at whatever age, at whatever level, and to really understand what it means to make sure that girls are going to school, not just saying, oh, school is free, not just saying, oh, Maybe you'll get free food once you get there. What are the other obligations? What are the other factors that are limiting female participation in school? Because we've seen time and time again that an educated woman is not only a woman who can escape poverty, but it's also a woman that lifts up her community. I read this statistic somewhere that it's really escaping me, but something like 70% of women invest 70% of their income back in their own communities. So we know that women who are doing well, it might even be 90, it's something like that. Women who are doing well lift up the entire community. Whereas men, I think the statistic was like 40%. Um, so I think really working to make sure that women are educated because education leads to better outcomes, better access to employment, um, raised incomes, which in, in turn benefit the entire community, and really listening to these women when they say, this is what I want, this is what I need. I think that's how we really um, can help those women who are much more vulnerable than us and who need our support the most. I'm all for education. Yeah. I'm and when you think about <laughs> the wealthiest, like I said, the wealthiest 10% in our society, even during a the pandemic, their wealth rose to $13 trillion. Even among that 10%, that they should have enough to educate every woman at some level in the world. So we're not living in a poor world. I think maybe we have um, the wrong mentality. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I feel that poverty, sometimes the state of the mind is the mindset, how you see yourself. Um, women are conditioned to believe that you grow up, you marry a rich man, he takes care of you, or men are supposed to be the breadwinners. So they are not raised to um, to be empowered. They don't raise to believe that you can work and make your own money, take care of yourself and even take care of your family. So I believe it's all in the mindset, encouraging women to work hard, making them believe that you can also make money. You could also take care of your family. It's not just the role of the man to take care of the woman. You can also take care of yourself. And I believe in mentorship. I believe that um, 
what you meant to women, I mean, in my community, I mean, growing up, there were people I looked up to. I mean, at the secondary school I chose, I chose because there was a lady in my area who attended the school every girls, and I saw her as a lady, so I wanted to be like her. So sometimes mentorship goes a, w- a long way to help women. People would want to be like you. There's someone in your community who thinks that, oh, you're such a classy lady. I want to be like you. How did you do it? It's no magic. Mm-hmm. It's going to school. It's about your mindset, believing you can do it, believing you can also be a rich woman. You don't have to be a wife of a rich man. You can be a rich woman. So I believe in the mindset. It starts from the mind. So you enrich them intellectually and then it manifests physically. That's how I see it. So. Well, that reminds me, Samira, I want to ask you about the elephant in the room, (laughs) because when we talk to women in private, we hear a lot about this sugar daddy kind of mentality. Um, And um, quite frankly, I've met personally a lot of brilliant women whose aspirations, quite frankly, was just to be kept. So maybe that's the models that they were exposed to. Um, They want to be kept. They don't really, why should I go out and, how do we address that as as a, like a internal kind of bias, a mentality that should be disrupted? And this is not to attribute blame, but it is very real among some women. As uh, Alezi mentioned, we accepting who we are, knowing that as women we are very powerful in every way, and knowing that you can also make money and do things for yourself. The basis, how we started, like we see our dad always giving money to our mom. And if the mom does, or the dad in Ghana is called chop money. So if your dad doesn't give you chop money, Mommy says, oh, there's no money at home. Today, daddy didn't bring money, you know. So it grows with us, and now we feel, okay, if we get a a richer man, a man who is much more richer than daddy, then we don't have to work, you know. Everything is provided for us. But I always say, how do you feel, you know, if you're always collecting and you're not putting anything on the table? So have a mindset that whatever that man is giving you, you can also work and even provide. Because there's nothing like always asking and when you don't want to give or give back. So work hard, make your own money and look after yourself. Because if the money, if the man is gone, maybe he's finished using you in quotes and he moves on to another lady. What do you do? Yeah. Well, what I'm talking about, I must say that um, I think women's empowerment is about choices. And I feel that if a woman chooses to stay home and the man is a provider, Mm -hmm. she is contributing a lot of value. Yes. Um, But what I what I think was problematic is when you have women that who've been robbed of a certain level of Mm self-esteem and they will choose to be taken care of, not by husbands, but even by married men, Mm -hmm. by anybody, because they don't believe that they can do it for themselves. Um, Because I don't have a problem with a man or woman being the provider in the home, because Mm -hmm. that is a division of responsibilities, and sometimes it can change. You have seasons where the woman may bring home. It's all customized, and, and that's what empowerment is. It's about choices. So I also don't feel that women should feel pressured or obligated to work outside of the home. Um, but what I'm trying to address, but thank you, that's a very good point, too, about culture. What I'm trying to address is an acute crisis of uh, low self-esteem mm-hmm. when women feel that the only value they can bring is to um, sell their bodies or to sell themselves in order to eat. And that is a reality for a lot of women. Yeah, it's true. Can I respond to that quickly? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that also the idea that women grow up thinking that, or women grow up to believe that they can't provide, doesn't really tally with what we know about Africa. Like we have the highest rates of female entrepreneurship in the world. Ghana specifically, I think, has the highest number of female entrepreneurs 
out of any country in the world. So I don't want us to fall into this trap of, oh, women aren't working or they're not providing for their families or they're not supporting their communities Mm -hmm. because they are. I also think with respect to the sugar daddy question or to the idea of women feeling like they can't provide more, what is telling women that they can't provide more? If I'm a woman in a bank and I'm just trying to do my job and every day some man is coming in and telling me, hey, actually, you you're, you have like a nice body, like maybe you would want this or maybe you should want that. And mm, I'm not going to give you that promotion unless you do X, Y, Z or do that or do this. And I think it's a real problem in our banking industry of them specifically hiring pretty women so that men can take advantage of them and if I'm a young girl coming out of school or maybe still in school because let's also not pretend like men don't drive onto college campuses looking for young women and some older man is telling me hey take this this that and the third a lot of these women I think I was having a conversation with someone are using that money to even support their families because as a student yes you can work but how much of your income can you really bring in I think yes of course as a woman you have agency but we also need to look at how institutionally we have created systems that support and actually make it more difficult for women to work and um be promoted in their respective fields if they're not doing if they're not providing sexual favors i mean the sexual harassment personally that i have experienced even working in an all-female company has been a little very stressful it's 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 not coming from obviously our company but even oh we would get rid of them tell me give me names give me names (laughs) definitely not coming from our company but as an average woman in ghana you're sexually harassed all the time we're not living in a system that is like that's which is precisely the problem that's like you're a man you're a woman it's about how well you work or how much you produce that is what the fundamental issue is here and i think that we do ourselves a disservice as women if we try to gloss it over and just say hey if you believe you can achieve if you believe you can achieve but you're gonna have to work a hundred times harder than any man to do so and that is something that can be done but it also shouldn't necessarily have to be the case women and men should put in the same amount of effort to be regarded the same exact way i shouldn't be killing myself to prove that i'm as good as a man i should have the opportunity just right off the bat to be like you're a human being you're capable of working as well as any other human being or even better depending on your actual ability so i just think that it's really important and maybe it's because i'm young but I think it's no, really... it's because you're smart and you're right, <laughs> and you are right, and you are right, and I think that this is a this. I, I have to applaud you that on that, and Shero, because that was very bold. But I don't think we can address this situation without men, and I've even told men just imagine that um, if that were your daughter. Because some of the men that are the most guilty of this thing, they are very protective fathers. So they don't see the, (laughs) but I really think that, I would say in America, we have a long way to go. We're still fighting this. But what has helped us is that some powerful men have gone down. So everybody knows there's a risk and you have a lot to lose. And um, I would just say from my experience across Africa, um, men don't lose anything from this kind of behavior. So in fact, they are sometimes applauded. And um, I think that um, we have to recognize the latent potential and power on this International Women's Day 2022. Women, you have the power to change this. And even if you must lead and bring men along. We have to because this is part of the thing that I've noticed that destroys the self-esteem of women. And when someone is powerless, um, when I say powerless in terms of economically vulnerable and maybe not exposed and maybe no one ever told her she had power, um, they're the biggest victims of this kind of thing. So one thing we can do is to build awareness and talk about it. But I believe, um, that's why I said, if it ever happens and I'm putting men on notice, I will call you out and I have in America, in Africa, anywhere. Um, Because some women have come to me and reported sexual harassment. And I have gone to the men and I've gone to their bosses and I've gone to um, others in some cases, I think is intolerable and I think we have to change this. So what I was actually trying to make a point that women have to learn to speak up. 
when it comes to this kind of harassment because men But how do they speak up when the when the price of courage is so high so it's easier for maybe a woman who comes from a powerful family and has resources and will be but there are some women that I know um, they're even encouraged by their mothers to partake in this kind of behavior because that man and this kind of practice is supporting the household. And so um, we have to really deal with it at multiple levels. Yeah. Sometimes we literally have to deprogram women from bad programming and deprogram men from bad programming um, because I think it's really a lot of men that engage in this kind of behavior are incredibly insecure. They're insecure because they have to do this to show that they have authority, power, or to they need this constant affirmation to feel good about themselves. And if they need that, then that means they also have a problem. So it's not just a woman's problem. Mm -hmm. Nana. Um, yeah, so I feel like um, over time there has been some improvement. So now more women know that they do have a choice. But then the thing is, well, the topic, as the topic says, about equality of opportunity. So um, with regards to the sexual harassment in the workplace, well, if you come to Africa, you realize that even less than 30% of the people who serve on corporate boards are females so if someone is sexually harassing you in your workplace and your boss is a male it's sometimes for most women they feel like it's really difficult for them to go to a man to explain what's going on and for some men they can't understand like they feel like oh some men think well i'm not being judgy but some men think it's not such a big deal i mean you can handle it or some men think oh why don't you just give in i mean it's just to get us a deal and that's just that but then it continues to something else so well i know of a, a friend of a friend who works in a company and her boss is male right well he's he's american but she says she has never been able to close a deal because every man who comes in every potential investor wants to sleep with her so she's never been able to close a deal and she's been working there for nearly two years and she can't come out to her boss because she feels like he isn't going to understand her so i think it's also an issue of leadership because there are less females occupying more leadership roles across the continent it's more difficult for women to come out and say this is what is happening at the lower level because as women do you generally feel supported by other women when you have these issues like you said maybe a woman on a board um do you feel comfortable going to a, another woman maybe in higher authority to say i'm facing this help do you generally find that that help is forthcoming from the women in the uh, workplace? Uh, Sometimes. No. Well, I for me, it's really is deeply personal for me. Like I, I should have developed some sort of like a, some trust with the person. So even if you're a woman, and you, I won't come to you just because you're a woman. woman. And, you know, you have to have a relationship. Yeah, some, that's some, why the mentorship is important. Yeah, and I truly believe in that. So unless that trust is there, because I've been in situations where the women will be the ones who work against you in companies, just wow. because you're a younger woman coming in, and you may probably take their work husband or, you know, you know, you know, they, they know yeah. these terms, you know. Yeah. So for that fact, I always used to wish I always wanted to work in in, in all male companies because I know that I, I'm going to get the competitiveness, the fairness. You know, I wanted that because if I worked with women, that was my mentality before. I'm like, these women are going to judge me based on how I look. And, wow, you know, we have a lot you know, of work so to do. We have a lot of work so to many, do. You know, and but being here and seeing women like you, Lady Rosa, giving oh. other women opportunities, seriously, it really plays... You don't even have to do anything. Just with your actions motivates me. And seeing other women like that. And so I already trust you by well, looking at you. I'm also tough. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tough. I yes, know it. Um, I love it. <laughs> but let me just say, I want to go to the second part of our conversation. Before you go to the okay. second part, can I say that normally the companies also play a part yeah. as to what happens in the organizations. Mm -hmm. Maybe I have been very fortunate, I've worked in companies where there are HR policies, 
you know, that guard against such actions where you are told or you are informed as a woman that if you have any encounter or if you have your bosses approaching you, mm-hmm. this is what you are supposed to do. There, there's a whistleblow email. You can send the email even without mentioning your name and it will be dealt with. Mm-hmm. So I think that companies have to come up with these policies to be able to protect women in their but organizations. Most, let me just say this. Yeah. I believe that culture, and what is culture? How things are done around here yeah. will trump any policy, any strategy. Mm. I mean, and um, just because it's written in a company stand for, like you mentioned, the banking sector, which is infamous yeah. for this kind of uh, practice. I'm not saying all banks, but they, they do have Some a reputation. Banks, um, so I'm sure they have great HR officials. They have great policies. But culture, the way things are actually done, um, and I'm not talking about culture with respect to an ethnic group, I'm just talking about the way things are done. Even um, in our society at home, it is still uh, a problem, and we have the most sophisticated HR systems that you ever want. Because even though there's a whistleblower policy, as a woman, I'm made to understand, and I've seen other women as examples, if I go there, I'm going to pay a tremendous price. And that's part of the culture of, uh, of bias, uh, that we're so deeply embedded in a culture mm-hmm. that we don't move even when we are told and legally we have the right to move. But I want to move to the, because we are we're short on time, um, I want to move to the second part of our conversation. The one thing I like about um, working with such fantastic women. And I say they inspire me every day. I wake up to the news and I think about my team and I do come to work most days um, excited because of these women here. Uh, Because I told them, especially in television, I said, and we're about to roll out like uh, new content um, that I think is gonna be exceptionally transformative. And I told them, that if I like it, then maybe it's not so good because of the demographic we serve across the world, they're more closer to your age group um, than, than my own. And so we have some wonderful content creators. And one, and one thing that I really like is when we have the opportunity to have talks like this. So I'm glad that we're bringing an audience into this. So I have asked you my questions, and now we're going to end by you asking me anything that you'd like to ask me i want to know what has been motivating you since and your 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 source of motivation up to today yeah okay i can say that my primary source of motivation i i mean i am unabashed i am an unabashed woman of faith so it comes to i'm informed by my faith and i too was I grew up and was raised with some very negative programming that limited women. But I had to reprogram my mind and my spirit with the word of God when I really met Jesus Christ and really began to understand who he made me as a woman. And then I began to feel that, you know, I am made, I am beautifully made. I was made with a purpose. I have an assignment. And I stay focused on that. And when I um, am disrupted or disappointed, and we all um, will live with a certain amount of pain and problems, um, I have a source that I can go to. So I would say that um, having um, that as my foundation, faith in God as my foundation, um, and having God as my source of strength when I'm weak. And I also understood that it's not just about having a changed life. That did change my life from the time I was 17. Um, and it's a journey. And I, you know, I'm not saying I'm perfect. It's a journey. But it's not just about having a changed life, it's about having an exchanged life. So I am every day exchanging my weakness for his strength, um, my doubts for his confidence, um, and recognizing that he left a part of himself in us, the Holy Spirit, 
Um, and whatever we feed the most will grow the most. So I'm constantly trying to feed my spirit to achieve a certain level of divine alignment so I can lead by the spirit because it's the only infallible part of us. I have not succeeded when I have led with my emotions and when I've led with my triggers or when I led with my doubts, when I led with old programming. And so I too have um, been a victim of many ways of some very negative programmings. And every day, sometimes they will raise their ugly head um, and I have to then replace it and exchange it. So for me, it's about an exchange life. And I will also say that I have sought out and I've had some powerful examples of women in my life. I mean, women that when I saw them when I was a child is only when I got older um, that, uh, that I learned that these were um, history makers. Um, I was um, fortunate at the age of 15 to meet the woman who was the first woman in America, Shirley Chisholm, to run for president of America. So having to, even at an early age, to encounter, and how did I meet them? A lot of these women. I sought them out. I didn't have aunties and people in my family. I didn't come from an elitist um, or that kind of background or people who were, it's great to have that. I didn't, so I sought them out. So examples, and if you don't have them around, you seek them out. Because one thing I will say um, about women all over the world that I have noticed most of them have such an element of goodness that when you seek them out, and you say, I speak up and say, I want to learn from you. I want to grow from your experiences. Most of them that I know are willing, more than willing. So one last question. Um, please, how would you describe your personality in three words? <laughs> how would I describe my personality in three words? I would say I am um, extroverted, and optimistic. And I don't know what the third. Funny. Bold. <laughs> oh, I would say, well, uh, yeah, I don't think I'm bold enough, actually, because there are some people that I need to call out that I haven't called out. Um, even in America, I haven't called out, and I'm always resisting the temptation. So I don't know if that's boldness or if that's, I just don't want to be triggered. But yes, I do believe that I, I'm optimistic because I, you will, you will find what you search for. So I search for optimism every day. Like I'm optimistic by having this conversation with you all. I'm optimistic when I come in to Dominion TV and I see something beautifully uh, innovated that I'm like, wow, creative genius. That gives me a sense of optimism. And so I'm, um, that keeps me going and, and, and I just feed my faith every day. My question is, is there anything that you would like or you would wish to add to your career and what would that be? Oh, let me just tell you, um, I've been very fortunate to have a very diversified career. As many of you know, I, um, I started off as a community activist in Washington, D.C. I then went on, I mean, after college, I was active and so I was a community activist actually. And I then became very passionate about alleviating poverty because I saw so much in a community that I wanted to change. And that led me to have a broader international focus. Um, and then I went to the, uh, I became a career diplomat and I, I worked for municipal government, then I went to the executive office of the U.S. president working on Africa. I've done a lot of things. And, um, and I've broken ground by the grace of God. Um, in the executive office of the president, I had to start the first ever in our history Africa trade office because we had already always treated Africa as charity and I started the trade office. And that was very, um, that was, I mean, breaking ground that didn't exist. But I can say by far the hardest thing that I've done is this launching of Dominion Television. 
Um, and is also the most rewarding thing that I've done. One is that I'm learning every day new things. I've made so many mistakes, but I've learned to treat them as research and development rather than, oh, I can't do this. Because I've learned over time that mistakes are only mistakes if you tag it as such. But if you say, oh, I'm learning, I'm learning. And I just find that um, this is very difficult, but I will do it because you know what I always tell you all, that old adage, um, go big or go home. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not looking at a modest media network. I'm looking at a network that will transform lives, that will bring the world the kind of con content that will inspire and empower and will change lives. And so that is a tall order. And I've never done it before. And so I think that is, that is the biggest sin. The uh, kind of frightening, but I'm embracing it at the same time. Um, so, um, as an excellent strategist and a successful businesswoman, I didn't know you thought of me as an excellent. <laughs> oh yes, strategist. I do. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. But I just wanted to know what's your take on breaking the bars for African women in the business sphere. Well, I really think that we have to. We can't leave it to osmosis. Everybody can do something, and everybody can do something different. So one thing that I believe is that we can support women-owned enterprises and we can support women in education. Um, and um, that is so critically important because we know that women make different decisions economically. So when you support women, you're supporting an entire community. And I think that, like you said, I think, you know, we don't have to always do it through the organized charity system. I love the way you do it in Africa, too, where you, you have extended family and you go beyond the extended family, where, you know, you're now, you know, there is a cultural obligation to take care of others. I mean, there's a reason why um, I've been in some of the poorest countries in Africa and I don't see the level of homelessness mm -hmm. that I see in America. And that's a part of the culture. That's a culture that I, I must be my mother's keeper, my brother's keeper, my neighbor's keeper. Um, and that even if you don't have anything, you have a village that you can re return to where you tell them from whence you came there's an obligation that they have to take care of you. Um, unfortunately, we've lost that, I think, in many Western countries. And I hope that that is something that we can adopt from Africa and bring to the world. Um, what three things would you say to a woman who is asking the question on how to unlock their potential? Mm -hmm. What would you say, at least three things? I think you have to, for me, everything is informed by my faith. I think that, you know, um, when you're dealing with God, he's infinite. So that means you tap into that infinite source, that infinite supply. Um, and it's not just knowing about God, it's knowing him as father. So know that we have a God that we can tap into, go to, who doesn't sleep or slumber 24 hours a day. Talk to him grow in that relationship. I would also say, so that's from the faith perspective, you have to change your mindset. I always talk about the mind because 95% of our brain is, operates on subconscious programming. Subconscious program, things that have been, we just do it subconsciously. Only 5% of our brain operates on conscious programming. So we have to be aware of these thoughts, of these projections, of the words that people have spoken over us and consciously decide what we choose to accept and what we choose to reject. And my premise is, I don't care whether it's family, friends, a job, a person, um, Try not to be in a situation or entertain even conversations of people that don't honor who you are. Yeah. And words that don't honor who you are. 
reject them. Because with our conscious minds and our conscious selves, we can choose what we allow to come in and what we accept. So I think that, so sometimes I'm around saying, I cancel, 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 cancel. In the name of Jesus, I cancel that. And so I will just end by your question by saying this, you gotta be very aware of your eye gate, your ear gate, and your mind, what you're looking at, what you're hearing, what you're seeing. And so that it doesn't come in and settle in your subconscious mind and cause you to doubt yourself and to limit yourself. That's what I truly believe. That's my secret. So Lady Rosa, if you had the opportunity to tell your 30 year old self anything, what would it be? I would tell my 30 year old self that to believe in herself and not to limit herself. And I would tell my 30 year old self not to be around people, if she can help it, that would limit her. And I would tell my 30 year old self um, to know God young um, and develop and strengthen that relationship. And I would tell my 30 year old self to live beyond any barriers. Um, so I think we've all had the opportunity to be mentored by you. I'm definitely very spoiled since this is my first job. Um, but I guess... No one would know that. You're fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess my question would be, how do you think that older generations of women can best mentor younger generations of women? And how do you also think that younger generations of women can best receive mentorship from older women? Okay, I think that one, we just have to be intentional about it. Um, like if you're busy like me, then you just hire women and you mentor them every day and every day you see them in your conversations. And so we had this saying, each one teach one, wherever you can pick them, from the church, from your community, just be intentional about mentoring. And I think that um, younger women have to be empathetic. It's, it's easy to be judgmental and critical. That women of my generation went through a lot, a lot of pain, um, a lot of hurt. Um, they talk about, I think, I mean, it's in about each generation weaker and wiser. Um, so, um, weaker but wiser. Um, our generation was strong, but I must admit, um, some of the stories that, you know, my mothers and grandmothers and people that I know, even across the world, women have really had untold suffering. So it's easy to judge them about what they should be doing. But once you step into their shoes, so in receiving mentorship, I just ask that younger women not be so sensitive. So if an older woman is triggered and she comes at you or she gives you some bad advice, just ask why. And if you ask why five times, you'll usually get to something that will help you to help her to heal. And so I say to be, open your minds to be receptive, but understand empathetically that, um, that women have before you have been through a lot as well. Uh, how are you able to blend your role as a, a minister's wife and a corporate woman? Because you do it so well and uh, yeah. Well, thank you for saying I do it well. But as you know, my husband, Archbishop Nicholas Duncan Williams, and he's even beyond a pastor, my goodness, he has so many roles. But you know what I think is that I have a very supportive husband. And um, we are a kingdom couple, and we are very much aligned um, with what God has intended us to do together. Um, so I receive an incredible amount of support from him, not to mention prayers. I mean, I was just like, oh, I'm just the most fortunate woman to have access to these incredible prayers. But I think that um, um, I'm able to do it because I have an understanding husband and we have great communications. When I feel that I'm falling short, I can't, um, I go to him and explain, we readjust, we are always, we just work very well together. And so it's a marriage about love, 
but is also a marriage about purpose, and we take it very seriously. And I not only love him, I love the purpose and the call of God on his life, so I'm going to support that too. So that I feel very fortunate. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us on this International Women's Day 2022. We hope that some parts of this conversation have blessed you. And let's continue the conversation. Just contact us on Dominion TV social media. And I personally will be reading them and will be responding. I can't say I will do it for very long, but for the next 48 hours, <laughs> um, let's block some time and I will be responding to your questions. And I will do that because I know when I was sitting where many of you are sitting today with a lot of unanswered questions, somebody, somebody's took the time to answer my questions. So if you will contact us on social media, um, and if you are a woman, I will make time to answer as many questions as I can. Thank you for joining us. Bless you.